On this Wednesday night, the coronavirus officially reaches pandemic proportions. What it Breaking means tonight, and President what Trump it calls for. Okay, this is a call to action and a call to control. As more countries much of our daily lives have been put back in the U.S. The list of the most important It's March 2020. The Dos Pueblos Theatre Company is only a couple of weeks away from opening their highly anticipated spring musical, Shrek. With an incredible cast, awe-inspiring set pieces, and a reputation that only comes with being based off of a film beloved by nearly every high schooler, the show promises to be a huge hit. There's a sense of excitement in the air, alongside the much more prevalent feelings of anxiety and fear felt by the cast and crew alike. Then, the unthinkable happened. On March 13th, the coronavirus pandemic cases in California reached a critical level, and the state was shut down indefinitely. This caused all schools to go online, and all in-person Shrek work to be postponed. All the hastily made attempts to put together some form of virtual show failed, and after a few weeks, the show was cancelled, going out with little more than a whimper. Thanks to a large portion of the general public disregarding safety regulations for months on end, the pandemic had exponentially worsened. Schools were still online, as were plays. However, at Dos Pueblos High School, Mr. Clark Sayer, Dos Pueblos' resident theater teacher and director, and several other minds were working on creating a new kind of theatrical performance, one for a more digital age. While the show was by no means perfect, it was the first dose of theater that many students had had in months, and served as a slight beacon of hope in the dark times at the height of the pandemic. It showed that Dos Pueblos Theater Company was not down for the count, and began the company's year-long journey towards an in-person play. A few months later, work began on 2020's holiday package, another yearly tradition that had to be adapted for these unprecedented times. Like Digital Age Stage, the show featured skits created entirely over Zoom. However, it also featured something incredibly important, in-person skits. While these skits weren't live, they were pre-recorded with multiple actors together in the same location, which marked the first time the theater company had done anything of the sort in over half a year. The show proved that it was possible to do work with actors in person, and laid the groundwork for a return to in-person theater. While the students were working on Holiday Package, Mr. Sayre began planning a spring musical with the help of technical director, Mr. Noel Greer. I think that um, it was unlike anything I'd had to do before because there was so much uncertainty. So at that point when we were choosing the show, which is around mm, probably October, maybe early November, um, we had no idea whether we would be in person, whether COVID would be fully like on lockdown still at that point in May. So there was just so many unknowns. We needed to find something that, um, that could work in a very compartmentalized way. In November, it was very uncertain what we would be allowed to do and what was a good idea to do on top of what was allowed. So what we tried to consider the most was what was going to keep everybody safe and then what would be a, a show that we could actually do. Once they knew what parameters they needed to operate within in order to adhere to COVID-19 guidelines and ensure that a show could be put on no matter what, 
The next issue was perhaps one of the most important decisions for any theater company, picking a show to do. We went through a few different shows that we were looking at. Um, Clark really wanted to do a musical and I was fighting really hard to not do a musical um, just because of the, um, the logistical differences and the cost differences. I was advocating for stuff like Shakespeare and um, you know Greek classics and other stuff um, that had really low royalty costs <laughs> associated with them. But Clark knows the, knows the student body a little bit better than I do. Uh, had a strong sense that the musical was really, really, really what everybody wanted to do. Along with the appeal of a musical, other things that helped settle the debate were the fact that many plays relied on actions such as kissing or sword fighting that simply weren't possible given the circumstances. As well as other schools in the region having done certain shows in recent years, therefore taking those shows off the table as well. Once that was settled, however, the two directors had another, more timely issue that affected their search for a show. COVID regulations limited the number of students allowed on campus in a cohort to 14 students, since they would also need one person to operate a camera to record the show as part of the cast cohort, that meant that the cast of the show had to be limited to, at most, 13 people. With that in mind, they settled on a show, acclaimed 1972 musical Pippin. Going into a show with so many unknowns, I thought Pippin would be a good, uh, a good choice. It can be small, um, it can be bigger, um, you know, and it's very episodic. It's not as much of a just straight through book musical as most of them are. With the show finally selected, the next step was to plan out the logistics of the show, which encapsulated everything from location to concept. We had to figure out um, where we were doing it. <laughs> we don't have a very good Greek theater for um, a public performance of that sort. The Greek theater was out pretty quickly in our plans. What I didn't really want to do is, um, you know, just just watch a bunch of people up um, up on stage wearing masks. There's just so much missing human human connection there. So I thought, okay, what can we do to make it so that um, at times, you know, we can get people's faces and expressions and stuff like that. And I think that's when, when I started thinking of the film idea. We knew it was a musical, and we knew that nobody could sing live because that's the biggest COVID no-no there is. So we figured out how on earth can we do this if people need to sing? And so we went through a bunch of different ideas, and they all involved recording everybody um, ahead of time. And then early on, I think it was Noel and me especially, maybe a little bit of Joya too, saying, um, yeah, we really want there to be a live component, but, you know, which really unlikely we're going to have people in the theater by that point. The desire to have live components to the show while also taking advantage of the option to pre-record things led to the creation of the unique hybrid show concept that made DPTC's Pippin so special. It was decided that while the show would be entirely pre-recorded in the event of further complications, there would also be plans made for portions of the show to be performed live and broadcast to the audience. At the same time, we were also coming up with this idea of using the audience for the show. The Ealing's Performing Arts Center, the on-campus theater of Dos Pueblos High School, features an enclosed concrete lot known by members of the theater company as The Yard. Throughout the years, it has been used for storage and construction, falling further and further into disorganization and chaos. However, the directors knew that if they could do what many had long considered impossible and clear out the yard, they would have the perfect place to build an outdoor stage from which they could safely perform the show. The yard was full of a whole bunch of other stuff at that point, and it was going to take a long time to actually take that stuff down while the cast was doing the recording that's when the crew started using that time to go through all of the junk in the yard and throw stuff away or move it inside this was the phase where the student crew was brought in consisting of nine students in a separate cohort 
the crew worked tirelessly throughout the following weeks to clear out the yard and prepare it for its new role as an outdoor stage. While there were nine students, there were only ever four working at one time, as only half the cohort was present on campus on any given day to increase safety. In addition, the ninth spot in the cohort was taken up by the sole person involved in making this documentary, who after the first couple of weeks contributed essentially nothing to the progress made in the show. The first thing they had to do was clear out all of the junk that had been sitting in the yard for many, many years. When we got here, it was full of storage for stock platforms and stock flats, uh, a shed filled with a bunch of doors and windows, many of which were destroyed, a whole bunch of other weird props that didn't fit in a lot of other places, like desks or uh, chests of drawers and a really nice barrel and then a whole bunch of other junk and props left over from other shows that ended up being demolished so that we could make room for the stage. However, through lots of hard labor, heavy lifting, not entirely pointless destruction, and lots of time, the students and Noel managed to clear out the yard and get it looking almost as nice as the day it was built. While this was going on, Mr. Sayer was working to finalize the creative vision for the show. The concept went from um, social media influencers. That was the first, the first big idea we had, and there was going to be these, these sort of uh, boxes uh, that people were in and stuff. And then that quickly got nixed the more I thought about, um, you know, like, oh, we were going off of Zoom for a reason. We don't want to see people in boxes on stage. At first, uh, Clark wanted to make it a great big commentary on uh, social media in in the in modern times, especially for students. And then when we brought that to the students, um, DPTC leadership was so concerned about this idea that they wrote a letter uh, to us. Uh, voicing their concerns and like they were they were right then we went to somebody said well let's do the 60s i thought oh that could be cool there's some really cool things that can happen we have the we have the war song so we're talking 60s uh you know vietnam war um and there's some other things that that went along okay with the 60s but it just it really wasn't inspiring me very much while the 60s idea may not have been the concept that stuck around for the entirety of the show, it was around long enough for elements of the concept to be created. Most notably, the giant mural that was planned as a backdrop for the stage in the yard was designed by Noel, and originally was heavily based on art from that time period. We designed a mural, like a great big 60s mural, to do the show, and we kind of realized that that was going to be the main jam scenery-wise, um, and then before we started painting, I think like about a week before we started painting, we scrapped the 60s idea altogether. After further discussions, it was decided that there were too many issues regarding the 60s concept, and the creative team switched gears yet again. But this was where things really fell into place and the final vision for Pippin that took audiences by storm in May was created. And then um, the image that really got me, and I don't even think this was my original image, was um, the kids coming up to this poster, which was you know closed due to COVID, and um, deciding they're going to do the show anyway. And once, once I had that idea of like, oh, this is a bunch of kids, putting on the show despite all the, you know, difficulties and hardships. Um, so as soon as I came up with that, then it really all fit, fit into place.
With a clearer vision finally nailed down, work could truly begin on preparing for the show. With the yard now cleared out, the crew began the work of applying a coat of primer to the entirety of the gigantic yard wall. While all that was happening from the crew, I was kind of adapting the mural design to be less, this is the 60s, and more, this is a mural <laughs> kind of thing, and tried to bring in more, um, more elements to tie it to the show itself. With the mural redesigned and the wall covered in primer, the crew would spend the next couple of weeks tracing the design of the mural, one section at a time, onto the wall with the help of the theater's projector. However, doing this proved more challenging than it sounds, as the projector's projections really only showed up on dark areas, meaning that the crew had to wait for the sun to set to use what little time they had left at the theater to trace as much as possible. When they didn't have a lack of sunlight to help them with their goal, a large tarp was strung up over a portion of the wall to provide them with some semblance of darkness. While not the prettiest or quietest of solutions, this system allowed the crew to trace out a large amount of the mural while they waited for darkness, and before long, it was ready to be painted. Miraculously, it was traced out with very few issues, with the only major mistake being an error in alignment that caused the mural to read Pippin for a couple of days. If only someone had listened to the cameraman. While there were no problems with the mural itself so far, the crew was having to deal with a different set of issues entirely, navigating in a pandemic world. Some people were more freaked out about it than others, and like, uh, totally reasonable, right? But everybody had their own degree of concern um, about it. So like, you had some people who, even with gloves and masks and hand washing and, and all of that, didn't want to be within like 12 feet of anybody else and then you had other people who were basically um who still weren't so like people would get a little close to you and you'd have to be like yeah okay but six feet please and then other times things are heavy and you can't lift them all by yourself and so like you need to work as a team so how do you get you know someone to lift something over here and the other person to lift over there and like yeah they're they're eight feet apart but they're also looking at each other and like it's a weird shape and somebody needs to grab it over here and so so all of that um was kind of a constant thing of needing to be always cognizant of like what is what is reasonable and what is safe um and and what is following the rules but also getting getting what we need to done but as the weeks continued to pass and the students adjusted to their new situation, things got easier. The crew was all hands on deck for the mural for the next couple of weeks. Thankfully, they no longer needed to rely on the projector to paint, and since they now had the entire outline of the mural at their disposal, they were able to divide and conquer. Some students even got to give their own input on certain aspects of the design. Even as early as the mural, there was room for embellishment. Uh from like a couple of students put their own spin on um, on the things that they were painting in there. Uh, and we ended up with a couple of cool texture ideas and a couple of shapes ended up being a little bit different. And then I think when it came to the final touches with color and stuff, um, students would come up and be like, okay, cool, so what color is this thing? And I would just kind of, and I just kind of threw my hands up and was like, you know what? I ran out of time and I don't know. What do you think? Like, I think this color kind of works, but it also might not make sense and, and balance wise. And so we were able to have a lot of discussions um, with the students about, you know, making, making choices there. And everybody kind of had, um, had a voice and had some input into, into what the show was going to look like. Thanks to the hard work and dedication of every crew member except the documentary guy, the mural was finished in only a couple of weeks. With its completion, the crew was free to move on to the next phase in their plan, and the yard wall was now a way to remember the show for many, many years. While the crew was hard at work building the set, the cast was doing work of their own. Their work had begun at the full company virtual table read way back in January. 
and after having weeks to go over the script and delve into their characters, they were being tasked with something usually reserved for Broadway shows. Pre-recording every single song in the show, with the guidance of Mr. Sayer and the help of his son, musical director and editor Blaine Sayer. We, do, we decided it would be um, safest to do most of the singing on film, so we could pre-record all the music and allow people to lip dub on camera. Another great skill for actors to have, right? Uh, between social distancing, few people on the set, and no live singing, we felt comfortable with filming most of the musical numbers. For the live, in-person musical numbers, we decided to use themed masks for each song, which allowed us to incorporate masking into the look and feel of the song. Our number one goal was always student safety. For the whole music process, uh, first we had to teach them online, um, all the parts yeah. online. So that was um, challenging because I was having to go through and like, all right, this is the song playing it on the piano and then hearing it through Zoom and singing it like uh, by themselves and also having like some sort of app that was difficult at times for some of the kids. On top of the issues presented by having to learn a song over Zoom, the cast originally couldn't sing together at all, which led to the recordings being incredibly low on energy. Um, the first round was really lackluster. Um, because it's, and you know, it's nobody's fault, but it's hard to, it's hard to direct a bunch of people singing together in the context of a musical where like, you're not just singing like to sound pretty, but you're singing with, you know, character and storytelling, but it really wanted people to be around each other where they could, you know, feed off of each other's uh, energy and they could hear each other at the same time while they were singing. There was no energy. Um, the The problem was it sounded all right, um, but there's such a difference when you can hear singers being in person and live. Um, so we brought them in. And the cast was able to utilize the practice rooms in the neighboring choir room for use as makeshift recording studios. In there, they were able to sing together four at a time while receiving live directions from Blaine, all while being completely sealed off from everyone else. Over the next month, cast members would come in throughout the week for hours at a time to record all their songs, as well as certain lines of dialogue for use in the show. On March 16th, just after a year since the pandemic shut down the school, the students of Dos Pueblos High School received their first small bit of relief. Santa Barbara County reached the less restrictive red tier of coronavirus infection rates, which meant schools and other places could open up more, despite things still being in as bad of a condition as they were when the pandemic first shut everything down. This was especially huge news for those involved with Pippin, as the red tier not only allowed for the hybrid reopening of Dos Pueblos, but it also did away with all intercohort mingling restrictions, meaning that the cast and crew were free to now interact with and be in the same area as each other. It's amazing. It's just like, you just, uh, you finally get to appreciate what it means to be in person and what live theater, how special that, that word live theater is. Because um, we did, I think we've done a really good job this year adjusting to crazy circumstances but there is nothing like live theater, you know, just the interaction with the cast, the interaction with the audience. I was pretty worried about it, to be, <laughs> to be quite honest. Um, because at the moment, I, I don't know, it's, it's weird. You get used to, you get used to various restrictions and you get used to working within um, a certain framework and you get used to the degree of, um, of control that you trick yourself into thinking you have when things are a certain size. I think the first couple of days back, we had to do a lot of um, a lot of corralling. With the school more opened up, more crew members began showing up at the same time, and crew members were now able to come on any day they felt like. This was fantastic news, as there was plenty of work to go around. The most pressing job facing the crew was the need for an outdoor stage which they would spend the next several days building out of spare flats that are usually used for Dos Pueblos' live holiday packages. We were also doing things like hanging the curtains for, uh, to film Wars of Science outside. 
three different times, I think, in three different ways with three different sets. We were also building you know, the props like the fireplace, the fire pit for Simple Joys, and gathering a bunch of those things together. Various those numbers we did as well because we also weren't entirely clear as it was going on how various things were going to be. So a lot of the stuff that we built ended up being um, the, their initial need was known maybe a couple weeks ahead of time. Another issue facing the prop and costume crews was the fact that most props and costumes needed to be ready weeks or even months before anyone would see the show, which was very different from the traditional process for school plays. Since the cast was done with recording audio at this point, they needed these props and costumes as soon as possible to be able to move on to the next phase in their process. That being the filming of the pre-recorded scenes, which were being filmed far before anyone would even watch them. While the crew finalized the new outdoor stage, the cast began rehearsing scenes with Mr. Sayer in the classroom. While some scenes had already been recorded, there were many others that had either yet to be recorded or were going to be performed live, which gave the actors more time to prepare and experience the joy of in-person rehearsals that they'd been robbed of for so long. Rehearsal track. Well, I'll sing you the story of the sorrowful lad. He had everything he wanted, didn't want no, what he no, had. No. He had wealth and wealth and name and fame and all of that noise. But he didn't have none of those simple joys. His life seemed purposeless and flat. Aren't you glad you don't feel like that? So he ran from all the deeds he'd done. He ran from things he'd just begun. He ran from himself, which is mighty fault of love. Out into the country where he played as a boy. He knew he had to find him some simple joy. He wanted some place warm and green. We all could use. have a simple voice that says why not go ahead and wouldn't you rather be a left-handed flea a crab on a slab at the bottom of the sea the man who never learns how to be free not to be cold and dead rehearsal tracks rehearsal Once the crew finished construction on the stage, the actors were free to use it for rehearsals, as well as the recording of scenes. Since many of the scenes needed to be set in the same area as the live scenes they would lead into, the production of those scenes had needed to wait. But with the set now finished, cast members began coming in even more frequently, day and night, to record a great deal of scenes for the show, which proved to be a much more challenging task than a traditional school play. Because we had to spend so much film, time filming and editing and just conceiving everything and then technically setting it all up, there really wasn't time to do the in-depth one character work slash, um, you know, timing work slash um, interpretation, all that stuff in rehearsals. Because normally, you know, you have a rehearsal schedule and you, you block a scene and then you work the scene and then you polish the scene and then you start running it. We only really basically blocked the scene and pretty much shot right after we blocked it. So we, we had to skip all of those processes in between. And thankfully we had really good um, actors that had you know, studied with me enough that they, they knew the process and they did a lot of the homework on their own. They really came in with good ideas. With the cast moving into the recording stage, the crew now devoted all their effort into creating the smaller props, costumes, and set pieces that would appear throughout the show. These ranged from everything from a giant sun parachute to customized masks for the musical numbers. Over the next couple of months, members of the crew would spend hours a day creating these things, alongside the larger set pieces such as the royal staircase and more technical creations such as a secondary stage for the parking lot and a custom pedestal to hold the projector.
After another month of work, opening night was quickly approaching. As the actors finished recording their scenes and rehearsing for their live segments, meetings were held between both those involved in the creative process for the show, which now included people such as Mr. John Dent, the school's video production teacher who was helping facilitate the video and live stream aspects of the show, as well as with the student crew, in order to create a plan for how the show would be run. All the maps and models and stuff of the space and the venue, and kind of we're we're figuring out where we can put anybody to make anything work. Um, so we figured out where can we actually put people? It's going to have to be the classroom, um, but some people are going to really have to be able to see the stage while while things are going on, or they won't be able to do their job. So then we had to, we had to kind of figure yeah. out who was going to be outside and who was going to be in the classroom. On top of the locations of everyone, the crew also had to figure out how to integrate new positions needed to run the show, such as a video switcher, camera operators, and a cue light operator. However, with some careful planning, the students in these positions were all able to work from places where they could do their jobs, while also complying with the newer COVID regulations, which had cut social distancing down to three feet in schools allowing multiple people to sit at a table to work a technical position, such as sound or lights, in the show. With everything planned and the scenes for the show recorded, the cast and crew moved into the most dreaded part of any show, the tech weeks. In the first few days, we're pretty rough. The tech process was tricky. Um, for most of our crew members, it was the first time they were working with a lot of that equipment, and so they didn't really get much time with it before they needed to do it for the show, which was a, a lot of pressure, a lot of challenges. In addition to unfamiliar technology, there were also plenty of issues that arose as a result of the unconventional presentation of the show. The setup for both the yard and the parking lot took a long time to put up and take down, and that needed to be done at the end of every rehearsal. There was also the glaring issue that was the fact that neither the crew nor the cast had ever done a full run of the show before. And as time went on and more technical problems arose, some that even delayed rehearsals for hours on end, they would never actually complete a full run of the show until opening night, which came far sooner than anyone had hoped. The time had come. Against all odds, and during a period of unimaginable adversity, isolation, and uncertainty, the cast and crew of Pippin had still managed to do something incredible. They were pulling off a live, in-person show, the first of its kind for the school in over a year, in an unforgettable, spectacular format. However, this wasn't the mindset for most of the students that evening. Instead, they were incredibly nervous. The cast was filled with the usual stage fright, and the crew was in unknown territory. Having never done a full run of the show before, they had no idea what it would truly be like or what issues could occur. On top of that, high winds the previous two nights had prevented them from ever running the climactic scene that took place on the roof of the theater, and they weren't sure if the winds would stay low enough for them to be able to run the scene for the show. And as one final blow, the students were essentially on their own. As Mr. Sayer was taking a hands-off approach, and Mr. Greer was trying to be involved as little as possible. Once we got to actually doing the show, stand by. The way that it usually works around here is that I like to train all the students to do everything they need to to run the show so that when the show actually goes on, um, I don't have to do anything. I need to just kind of watch it and enjoy it and take notes, and then in the event of like, you know, an unforeseen emergency, then I'm the one who doesn't have another job, I can run around and put out that fire, metaphorically. And so I was doing a lot of that during tech, and then once the show was actually up, I, you know, it was going, it was out of my hands. It was, it was, it was the students doing the show. And do the show they did. The show ran great, with very minimal errors, even with some last-minute improvisations from the crew. Thanks to the help of two members of the DP News team, 
Mr. John Dent, and Gabriel Castleman, alongside the crew's own broadcast technical expert, Allison Togami. The show was able to be streamed both to the drive-in audience and those at home without any problems, and the cast delivered incredible and captivating performances that took everyone by storm. The hard work continued to pay off the next night, closing night, and the show ran even better the second time, while also featuring some last-minute additions from Mr. Sayer. The wind cooperated again, and the rooftop scene was able to be presented live on both nights, truly a climax that the audience would remember for the rest of their lives. I thought it was really one of the coolest things I've ever done. I've been doing this for, God, a lot of time, a lot of years. Um, and it's really one of the coolest things I've done. It's really one of the coolest things I've ever seen. Um, it's just was absolutely fresh and, and just building up to that, like actually having them on the roof at the end, you know, it was just, um, it was really magical to me. At the end of it all, at a time when in-person theater seemed almost impossible to pull off, and the students of Dos Pueblos High School were going through a generation-defining crisis. The work of the cast and crew of Pippin paid off, and the show was a huge success. It truly was the glorious return that members of the Dos Pueblos Theater Company had dreamed of, one filled with laughter, joy, struggle, and triumph. An experience worthy of, and deserving of, having its own story told. I figured in the very beginning that I, like, the design wasn't done. Uh, we were changing things all the time. Our concept wasn't solid. We still weren't sure what was going to be live, what was going to be recorded, and, like, what all was going to be a whole music video kind of thing. Um, but I figured that if if we do nothing else but give students a reason to get out of the house, um, that it's going to be worthwhile. Like it's it's going to be serving the mission of of the school and the program. And like, if, if all we get is that, that's going to be enough for a while. Here's what I want people to get from it: if something comes up that is not what you expect so you get sidetracked in life something just you this is not how i want this to go you have a choice to make you can go okay we're gonna plug through and we're gonna make sure this happened um you know like i know some schools are like okay we're gonna make sure that you know that we're out performing you know in person with you know and like what if that wasn't possible <laughs> What if literally COVID was still like, no, we're doing, people still can't gather, you know? Like, so you can't put your eggs into a basket that you don't even know if it's gonna hold, right? You need to, in, when life gives you um, lemons, you make lemonade, right? So if life gives you uh, no stage, then you have to make one up. <laughs> you have to make, you have to completely re-envision what, theater means and that's that's i think what we did and i think that's really what i want people to get out of it is like there's nothing in life that can stop you um from doing doing what you want to do and may look different than what you um thought it would look like um but um but it's going to be really really cool if you just let yourself step out of the box and go okay we're going to try something new I um, I don't know if I, I guess this is happening more and more as I get older, but I like I like the feeling of of uh, jumping off a cliff or <laughs> or or diving in, into the deep end of the pool and kind of not knowing what's uh, what's in store, and um, that's just really exciting. And to me, I think that's what we did too. I think that we had this, this thing that could have just completely bombed, right? There's so many tech elements that could have just like, oh, wow, it just didn't work. We couldn't get it to work, sorry, right? But we all just said, okay, we're trusting in, trusting in the experts and, you know, and, you know, I had to do that. I, I, there's no way I could have made it technically work.
to after the point of I had all the things on film and all that, you know, in, in terms of the TV stuff, it's like, thank you, John Dent. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Noel. Um, thank you, Amaya and Marissa and Allison and ev all the people that made no. the tech work because there's no way we could have done what we did um, without, without all of this tech. Um, innovation and just hard work um, and all that so so and I think um, it's interesting because because this show in a way tech was the star of the show I have so many people come up after the show and say I cannot believe what a technical achievement that was like wow yeah you're right <laughs> it was a brilliant technical achievement a lot that happens over this, this past year, with, without a way to talk. I know everybody has had something happen in their lives. I know that I've had tragedies in my own life. And so the fact that we are here celebrating in spite of everything is such an achievement. We have all just come together in our shared love of just making art. I hope you guys know this, that theater really is art. I know that everybody has had multiple conversations with all of you about how theater has touched each and every one of your lives. Each one of you knows the power that theater has. I've seen it change minds. I've seen it change lives. It's definitely changed mine. And just being able to work with all of you has genuinely been one of the greatest pleasures of my life. This is my last spring show. This is many of our last spring show. I'm having my own internal struggle about that. But knowing that I've got just such an extraordinary cast, I, I couldn't have asked for a better cast. And I couldn't have asked for a better show. Sorry, I'm trying so hard not to cry right now. And just seeing all of you grow from the people who have been doing it, you know, since they were children. To the people who have just kind of joined theater for the first time. At least the you know, for the first show at EP. Some of you, this is your first great show you're actually doing at EP. There's two full years of students that have never done a main stage show. And I know it's not exactly how we thought it would be, but I think that's kind of fun. I mean, being able to watch it in such a unique way, I think is going to give the audience a whole new experience of theater, the, the like that they've never seen before. I, I, we are doing something that is, I've never seen done. I don't know, I, I mean, it's probably been done, but like, I've never seen it. We are bringing a whole new form of theater. And it's wonderful. That's what I was saying, sorry about the four little dudes were there. I watched every single one of you grow. And seeing you progress within your characters as an actor and as a person, getting to know each one of you better. There are people that I've known for years, but I've made better friends with. There are people that I've been meeting, and then I feel like I'll have known them forever. What? Whether it's windy, whether it's hailing, whether somebody has COVID. I know because we have. We are doing this show. Yeah. 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 We have persevered. here. We have come back every time stronger than ever. And now we are going to go out there and give them the show of their lives. Well, so Damn. Yeah. <laughs>
And no matter what, that is going to shine the worst. It has been the honor and the pleasure of my life to stand amongst you today. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm ready to go out and just do the show that we have wonderfully prepared. Well, Thank you.